Hi, Ned. It's Tammy from the clerk's office. I'm going to unmute your mic. Can we test your audio, please? Hi, this is Ned McCloska. Hi, thank you very much. You're coming through clear. So I will mute my mic now? Yes, please. Thank you. Good evening, Mr. Chair, members of committee. It is now 7 o'clock, and uh, you can proceed to begin this evening's meeting. Thank you very much, uh, Peter. And uh, we will now to proceed uh, um, to our uh, roll call for attendance at today's virtual meeting of Brampton's Planning and Development Committee. And I'll hand it over to the city clerk uh, to uh, do attendance. Members of committee, I will call your name. Please indicate your presence in today's meeting. Councillor Dillon. Councillor Dillon, I don't see present at the moment. I'll come back to him. Councillor Singh. Present, and uh, Peter, I'll be switching to my laptop, but just it started updating, just an FYI. Okay, thank you. Councillor Fortini. I'm here, Peter. Thank you. Councillor Williams. Good evening, I'm here. Thank you. Councillor Bowman. Present. Thank you. Councillor Pileschi. Good evening, present. Thank you. Councillor Willens. I'm present here. Thank you. Councillor Vasante. Present. Thank you. Councillor Santos. Good evening. Thank you. Councillor Dillon. Uh, and Chair Medeiros is present. We have, uh, I don't see Mayor Brown present or Councillor Dillon. We have nine members present. Mr. Chair, you have quorum. Thank you very much. Our next item is approval of the agenda. Does any member wish to add a business item for tonight's meeting? Mr. Chair, just uh, if you're looking just for chats, just a few updates uh, for the agenda this evening. Um, there was an item identified on the original agenda as 10.1, an application to amend the official plan, zoning bylaw, and draft plan of subdivision for side estates, KLM planning partners, and Ward 8. Uh, that item, members will recall, was considered by the City Council last week, March 2nd, and was dealt with through resolution C043-2022. So that item has been removed from the agenda. I also just wish to point out that we do have uh, a delegation, two delegations under item 6.3 this evening regarding item 8.1, Brampton Heritage Board minutes. There has been a request for one of those delegate from one of the delegations to proceed prior to the statutory uh, public notice items. I know that has not been the convention of, of this committee, but I'm just raising it for a committee's awareness. Okay, thank you uh, very much. Um, so I do not see any additional speakers. Uh, so can I have a, a motion moved by Councillor Fortini uh, to approve um, uh, changes to the agenda, that the agenda for the Planning and Development Committee meeting of March 7th be approved. Is there anyone opposed? I see none. Motion carries. Uh, do any members have a declaration of pecuniary interest under the Municipal Conflict of Interest Act for any matter to be considered on today's agenda? 
Seeing none, the clerk will so note for the meeting minutes. Uh, we now move to our consent motion and uh, um, I'll read the relevant agenda items and members can identify any items to be held for debate. <clears throat> First item is item 7.1, a staff report regarding application for temporary use <clears throat> zoning bylaw, Darcy Holdings, uh, Blackthorn Development Ward 10 in consent. Uh, item 8.1 is, I believe there's a delegation in relation, so we'll, 8.1 uh, will be pulled. Uh, item 8.2, Cycling Advisory Committee, uh, February 17th, in consent. So I do have a motion uh, moved by uh, Councillor Singh to approve the consent motion. Uh, the following items were considered to be routine and non-controversial by committee and were considered at one time, so I'll hand it over uh, as we uh, agree through this process, uh, that it will be on a recorded vote, and I'll hand it over to our city clerk to uh, administer it. Through you, Mr. Chair, to members of committee, the, cons uh, the consent motion is before you for approval for items 7.1 and 8.2. All in favor, please indicate. Councillor Dillon. I don't see present at the moment. I'll come back. Councillor Singh. Yes. Thank you, Councillor Fortini. I'm here. Yes. Thank you, Councillor Williams. Yes. Thank you, Councillor Bowman. Yes. Thank you, Councillor Pileshi. Yes. Thank you, Councillor Willens. Councillor Willens? Yes. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, Councillor Vasante. Yes, in favor. Thank you, Councillor Santos. Yes. Thank you, Councillor Dillon. I don't see us. Present and Chair Medeiros. Yes. Uh, that motion carries nine to zero. Thank you. Uh, we, we now move on to our statutory public meeting reports and uh, we will now proceed. And sorry, I'll have to just read out for the public's interest because I do know there are a lot of residents um, who don't understand or have some questions regarding the statutory public meeting and what it is. So uh, for clarification, this is a public meeting of the Planning and Development Committee held in accordance with the requirements of the Planning Act of Ontario. The proposals to be heard at this public meeting are the result of applications made under the Planning Act. These are not proposals of the City of Brampton unless they are specifically identified as city-initiated proposals. Tonight, we do not have any city-initiated proposals for a statutory public meeting. The intent of this public meeting is to receive submissions from the public regarding these proposals. Given we may have persons watching this meeting through the City's live stream, we will have staff present each proposal subject to a statutory public meeting unless committee decides otherwise. After receiving any pre-registered delegations, members of the committee may ask questions for clarification, but will not engage in debate on the proposal at this time. Committee consideration of the proposal will occur at a future meeting when planning staff bring forward the final recommendation report on each proposal. The city also has posted to its website, Brampton.ca, supporting information and documentation for these development applications for public review and, and uh, uh, reference. We will now proceed to consider the four items on this evening's statutory public meeting agenda. After consideration of these public meeting items, committee will deal with the balance of the agenda items on tonight's agenda. Our first item, staff report 5.1, is an application to amend the zoning bylaw proposed draft plan and subdivision, Sorbram Developments Incorporated, Glenshner and Associates, Ward 10. And I will now uh, hand it over for a staff presentation from Stephen Dykstra from uh, our uh, Development Planning, Building and Economic Development uh, Department. Welcome, Stephen. Sorry through you, Mr. Chairman. Seems we might have a technical issue if uh, Stephen Dextra isn't able to click through. Um, if that is the case, uh, that we'll have one of our planning uh, managers, Stephen Ganish, report and uh, present the slides on Stephen's behalf. Um, Steve Ganish, would you mind presenting uh, the item, please? I can I can do it. I just uh, when my video starts, it uh, really delays me. So I apologize if. Um, I'm going to have to do this presentation without my video. I hope that's okay. Yeah, and that's fine. Uh, thank you, Stephen. And uh, this is our okay. new COVID world. So go ahead. <laughs> thank you. My connection is not the greatest. 
So good evening, uh, Mr. Chair, members of the committee and the public. My name is Stephen Dykstra, as you can see by my lovely name there. I'm the development planner and I've been assigned to, to process and review this application, which is to amend the uh, official plan and zoning bylaw, and it's also for a plan of subdivision. As already stated, the purpose of this public meeting is to provide information to the public and seek feedback on the application. No decisions are going to be made at this meeting and it's for information purposes. This is for file 00048. The applicant is Sorbrum Developments and the consultant is Glenn Sharn Associates. Next slide please Alan. The subject properties are located on the east side of the Gore, approximately halfway between Countryside Drive and Castlemore Road. It's on the east side of Brampton. Next slide. As you can see here, the surrounding land uses to the north, east, and south are currently vacant. These lands are part of a secondary plan, which includes uh, detached dwellings, townhouses, schools, and parkland. These are all part of Area 47. And the lands to the west, west of the Gore Road, are large lot residential dwellings that are existing. Next slide. This is what the applicant is proposing. This proposal is going to require a zoning bylaw amendment uh, to permit the residential uses, as well as a draft plan of subdivision that will create the lots and blocks for the development. Next slide. Here are some highlights. So this development is proposing 118 single detached dwellings, uh, sorry, single detached residential dwellings, a number of single detached blocks, uh, an elementary school, a stormwater management pond, valley land and associated buffer blocks, a small compensation area, as well as the roads and laneways to facilitate this development. Next slide. This map shows the property owners that are within a 240 limit, and these would have all received notice by direct mail with respect to this application. Notice was also provided in the Brampton Guardian newspaper, and it's also on our website. Next page. In evaluating this application, we'll be looking at against the existing provincial and municipal policies, including the Planning Act, the Provincial Policy Statement, the Growth Plan for the Greater Golden Horseshoe, Region of Peel Official Plan, City of Brampton Official Plan, and it's not written on there, but the Industrial 427 Secondary Plan as well. Next page. So this here shows the official plan. It's designated residential and open space. This application is not going to require an open, uh, an official plan amendment. Next slide. Here we have the secondary plan. It's designated low density residential, low medium density residential, elementary school, valley land, and this is all within the industrial 427 secondary plan. An amendment is not required as it meet, as it matches this um, secondary plan. Next slide. And here we have the block plan, which shows uh, that the property is identified as executive residential, low medium density residential, elementary school, stormwater management pond, valley land and compensation area. This again is part of industrial 427 block plan area 447-2. No changes are necessary to this plan either. Next slide. Here we have the existing zoning bylaw. It shows that the lands are currently zoned agriculture, which only permits uh, agricultural and a single detached dwelling. An amendment to the zoning bylaw will be required in order to permit the proposed single detached uh, dwellings, townhouse development, as well as the institutional and open spaces. Next slide. And here we are with uh, the uh, steps, the kernel chronologically. Um, the notice of complete application was sent out on February 2nd, 2022. It's been circulated. Notice went out today, March 7th, is the public meeting. After this, we'll be collecting all the information, technical information. And after that, a report will be then, uh, will go to council, after which if a decision is made, there will be a, an appeal period 
after that. Last slide. There's the contact information. The report associated with tonight's meeting will be available online. And my name is Stephen Dykstra. My contact information is posted there on the screen. The contact information for the consultant is Mark Condello from GSAI, and that's his number information and information there. And that concludes my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, City Clerk, do we have any delegations? Through you, Mr. Chair, there are no delegations and no correspondence on this item. Thank you very much. So I do have a motion as this word uh, 10. Uh, uh, motion moved by Councillor Singh, and we'll take it as read. Uh, anyone opposed? I see none, so the motion carries. And we go now to our second item, item 5.2, a staff report regarding application to amend the zoning bylaw. Um, w. E., uh, Alcred and Associates, Greenway Real Estate, 5 Copper Road, Ward 3. Uh, and I will welcome, uh, is it, we do have a staff person, my apologies. There was a last minute changes in it. So it's not Nicola, it's Natika, right, I believe? Yes. Yes, welcome. Thank you uh, um, from our uh, Planning, Building and Economic Development Department and uh, welcome. Thank you so much. Uh, good evening, Mr. Chair, um, committee members, members of the public. My name is Natika Jaktiani and I'm the planner assigned to process and review this development application. The purpose of this public meeting is to provide information to the public and seek feedback on the application filed by WE Outrun and Associates Inc. on behalf of Greenway Real Estate Inc. Next slide, please. The subject sites located on property municipally known as Five Copper Road and are located to the east of Tomkin Road, west of Copper Road and north of Advanced Boulevard. Next slide, please. The applicant has submitted an application for a zoning bylaw amendment to permit the unlimited outdoor storage of trucks and trailers on the property. This use is proposed to be accessory to the existing warehouse and truck transportation uses on the site. Next slide, please. The subject site has the following um, one site before, please. The subject site has the following characteristics, um, has a existing one story building with a gross floor area of approximately 7081, 7,081 square meters, is a thorough lot with a frontage on both Copper Road and Tompkin Road, uh, has site area of 2.4 hectares, and existing driveway is located at the southerly extent of the lot, which leads to the paved area on the south side of the building, with the area to the west and building also being paved. A large row of deciduous trees is located along the Tompkin Road frontage and a 2.4 meter high wooden fence is also located there as well. This is a map showing the properties within 240 meters of the proposed development who would have received notice by direct mail with respect to the application. Not notice would have also been provided to the Brampton Guardian newspaper and the City of Brampton website. Next slide, please. The applicant has submitted an application for a zoning bill amendment to permit the unlimited outdoor storage of trucks and trailers on the property. This use is proposed to be accessory to the existing warehouse and truck transportation uses on the site. The Committee of Adjustment had previously approved variances to allow the truck storage on a temporary basis on site. The purpose of this application is to request permission for this already existing use permanently. Next slide, please. Uh, the application will be evaluated against existing provincial and municipal policies, including those found in the Planning Act, Provincial Policy Statement, Growth Plan for the Greater Golden Horseshoe, Region of Peel Official Plan, City of Brampton Official Plan, and Highway 410 and Steel Secondary Plan. Next slide, please. The subject sites designated industrial in the City of Brampton Official Plan. This designation permits a wide range of industrial uses and activities. An amendment to the official plan is not required to facilitate the proposed development. 
Next slide, please. The property is designated General Employment 1 in the Fort and Steel Secondary Plan Area 5. This designation permits warehousing and storage of goods as an accessory to the industrial use. The proposed use will be accessory to the existing use and therefore an amendment to the secondary plan is not required to facilitate the proposed development. Next slide, please. The subject site zoned M1 in the industrial one in the zoning bylaw amendment. Um, the zone permits a number of industrial and some non-industrial accessory uses. Outside storage is not permitted in the M1 zone. An amendment to the sec zoning bylaw is required to permit this development. Next slide. Uh, comments from staff and external commenting agencies are required in order to complete a comprehensive analysis for this application. The following matters to be addressed have been identified at this time through staff's preliminary review of the application. These and any other matters identified through the processing of this application will be addressed in future recommendation report to the Planning and Development Committee. Some issues are need for potential further mitigation to reduce visual impact of trailer storage on adjacent arterial road, which is the Tompkin Road, and also the need to reduce, uh, need to limit the size of the area that would be used for outside storage. Next slide, please. This slide shows where the staff are in the review of the application. We're now at the public meeting stage where committee members and staff are here to listen to any feedback from residents. After tonight's public meeting, staff comments received from city departments, agencies, members of the public that submitted correspondence as well as matters raised at tonight's public meeting through the public delegations will be reviewed and evaluated. The group plan will be further assessed, the proposal will be further assessed against a provincial policy statement, the growth plan for the Greater Golden Horseshoe, the regional official plan, the city's official plan, and secondary plan. Once the analysis and evaluation is complete, staff will return to the Planning and Development Committee with the recommendation report. This recommendation report will address all ma matters raised by the members of the public, external agencies, and other city departments. Anyone that provide their contact information with respect to this application will be advised when a recommendation report will be considered by the committee. Once a decision is made on the application by City Council, there is an opportunity to appeal the decision at the local planning appeal tribunal. Next slide, please. This report associated with tonight's meeting is available online and the presentation will be available online shortly as well. Again, my name is Natika Jaktiani and my contact information is posted on the screen. Also on screen is the contact information for Arlene Beaumont of WE Outred and Associates Inc. who is here tonight representing Greenway Real Estate Inc. Thank you. This concludes my presentation. Great. Thank you very much. City Clerk, do we have any delegations? Through you, Mr. Chair, there are no delegations and no correspondence on this item. Thank you very much. So I do have a motion moved by Councillor Bowman. Uh, and we'll, the motion's on the screen. We'll take it as read. Is there anyone opposed? I see none, so the motion carries. Our next item is a staff report regarding application to amend the official plan Zoning bylaw, uh, M Plan Ivory Group, 227 229 Main Street, Ward 3. Uh, and I will hand it over to Kelly Henderson from our Development Plannery, uh, Building and Economic Development uh, Department. Welcome, Kelly. Good evening. Thank you. Good evening, Mr. Chairman, committee members, and members of the public. My name is Kelly Henderson, and I'm the planner assigned to process and review this application. The purpose of this public meeting is to provide information to the public and seek feedback on the application filed by M Plan Inc. on behalf of Ivory Group. Next slide, please. The subject property is located at 227 and 229 Main Street. It's located on the west side of Main Street and north of Charlotte Boulevard within Ward 3. Next slide, please. The applicant has submitted an application to amend the official plan and zoning bylaw in order to facilitate a mixed use development. I will provide additional detail with respect to these documents later on in the presentation. 
Next slide, please. This is a map showing the property owners within a 240 meter limit of the proposed development who would have received notice by direct mail within respect to the application. Notice was also provided in the Brampton Guardian newspaper and the City of Brampton website. Next slide, please. The subject proposal consists of two properties that are currently occupied by commercial buildings and a parking lot. The site is approximately 1.6 acres in size and has a frontage of approximately 92 meters along Main Street and 88 meters along Charlotte Boulevard. There's also ongoing work to study extending the LRT to the downtown and that there may be an LRT stop in front of the site in the future. Next slide, please. I will now get into the specifics of the proposal. The applicant is proposing to develop the site for a mixed use development, which would include 400 residential units and 470 square meters of ground floor commercial space. The height of the proposed building is proposed to be 19 and 26 stories with a floor space index of 6.1. Floor space index means the ratio of the floor area to the site area. For example, if your site area was 1,000 square meters, and your FSI was 3.5, you would be permitted a 3,500 square meter building. Next slide, please. This is a proposed building elevation. Next slide, please. Prior to finalizing recommendations to Council, this application will be further evaluated for consistency with the Planning Act Provincial Policy Statement, conformity with the Growth Plan for the Greater Golden Horseshoe, the Region of Peel Official Plan, the City of Brampton Official Plan, and the Brampton Flower Town Secondary Plan. Next slide, please. The lands are designated residential on Schedule A of the official plan. An amendment to the official plan is not required. Next slide. The property is located within the Brampton Flower Town Secondary Plan and is designated neighborhood retail and high density residential. An amendment to the secondary plan is required to facilitate the report. Proposal. Next slide, please. The property is zoned residential and commercial as by bylaw 270 2004 as amended. An amendment to the zoning bylaw is required to facilitate the proposal. Next slide, please. The following preliminary issues have been identified to date. The development proposal must be sensitive to the existing neighborhood context and establish an appropriate transition and physical integration with adjacent properties. The applicant will need to demonstrate through the submission of a shadow impact study and imp implementation of urban design principles to ensure that the appropriate building setbacks have been considered to mitigate any impacts on the adjacent properties. The appropriate road widening and entrances from a traffic perspective will need to be considered as well as an ensure appropriate pedestrian realm. Any potential issues that are raised throughout the processing of this application will be addressed through the recommendation report at a later date. Next slide, please. We are now at the public meeting stage where committee members and staff are here to listen to any feedback from residents. After tonight's public meeting, staff comments received from city departments, agencies, members of the public that submitted correspondence as well as matters raised at tonight's meeting through the public delegations will be reviewed and evaluated. The proposal will be further assessed against the provincial policy statement, the Greater Golden Horseshoe Growth Plan, the Region Official Plan, and the City's Official Plan and Secondary Plan. Once the analysis, evaluation, and technical review is complete, staff will return to Planning and Development Committee with the recommendation report. The recommendation report will address all matters raised by members of the public, external agencies, and other city departments. Anyone that provided their contact information with respect to this application will be advised on the recommendation report will be considered by the committee. Once the decision is made on the application by City Council, there is an opportunity to appeal the decision to the Ontario Land Tribunal. Next slide, please. The report associated with tonight's meeting is available online and the presentation will be available online shortly. Again, my name is Kelly Henderson and my contact information is posted on the screen. Also on the screen is the contact information from Michael from Mplan Inc. who represents the property owner. Thank you and that concludes my presentation. Thank you uh, very much and I do know I do know City Clerk we have delegations so I'll hand it over to you to uh, uh, administer the delegations. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. Through you, Mr. Chair, to members of committee, we have seven registered delegates this evening for this item, plus I believe at least six pieces of correspondence identifying under 11.1 .1 on tonight's agenda. We also have the applicant available should there be any questions of the applicant regarding this application. So the first delegate uh, tonight is Jason Lauder. Jason, you are in the session. Excuse me, you are in the session. You have up to five minutes to address committee on this matter. I will provide a reminder at four minutes and 30 seconds uh, for you to wrap up your delegation if you haven't concluded. Uh, so Jason, you can begin. Wonderful, thank you very much. And uh, thank you for the opportunity to present to you tonight. Uh, greetings to city staff and councillors, especially to my ward three and four representatives, uh, Councillor Bowman and uh, Mr. Chair, Councillor Medeiros as well. Uh, I am Jason Lauder. I'm a citizen representative. I'm a resident of Riverview Drive in Peel Village and uh, interested because my property is about 200 meters uh, in proximity to the development proposal and is being um, affected by it uh, by means of the shadows cast onto my land. Um, I'd like to start by stating that I'm an enthusiastic supporter of the official Brampton plan and the city's uh, 2040 vision document. Uh, I understand the need for uh, implementing smart urban growth strategies uh, to meet projected population growth in the greater Golden Horseshoe region, and also to comply with the provincial government's A Place to Grow uh, initiative. Um, these properties, uh, the subject properties, lie within the designated Gateway Mobility Hub area and the Regional Intensification Corridor, and as such are prime candidates for redevelopment. While we will be losing a building with interesting mid-century architecture and a significant number of mature trees, the need to create 10-minute walkable and livable complete communities is acute. The alternative is simply unthinkable, which is to continue to sprawl further out in low density, one to three story buildings, utilizing prime farmland and other valuable green spaces. We only have one major green field left in Brampton, so the solution to population growth which fuels economic growth is intensification, infill and brownfield development. Given that, it's clear that I support turning these underused properties into enhanced sustainable neighborhoods, including both these subject properties as well as other nearby proposals for 499 Main Street South and 2 Bartley Bull Parkway. Having said that, if council and this committee seek to obtain public buy-in from existing communities, you will need to find workable solutions to balance the needs of developer proponents and Brampton citizens. This is particularly true in instances where the infill projects are immediately adjacent to established residential communities. One of the most significant implications which the committee should consider is the shadow impact study outlined in the study submitted by the applicant. In this case, the residents of Hodgson Street, their neighbors on surrounding streets and the residents of Amica Peel Village are the most critically affected. But so too are my neighbors and friends on the east side of Main Street South on Pine Tree Crescent and Riverview Drive, where I reside. Natural sunlight is critical to mental well-being and can also significantly impact the enjoyment of property as well as property values. Given the significant shadows this development would cast if approved at current heights, I and many of my neighbors believe that staff should work with Ivory Development Group to amend the proposal to maintain the overall objective and design, but with a compromise on height to make it more suitable for its close proximity to these long established adjacent properties. I believe in free enterprise and fully support the desire and right of these landowners to earn a healthy profit from, from redeveloping these properties. But a win-win compromise ought to be negotiated where building heights are lowered while still offering significant density and intensification yet has less adverse impact on the community. Using a 45 degree angular plane from the western property boundary, a height of approximately 17 stories would be more appropriate. This is still more than double the height of the neighboring retirement residents, but would significantly increase the quality of life of its residents compared to the current 19 and 26 stories proposed. The proposed architectural design, which is rather attractive, would not need major revision. The overall footprint and landscape plan with its highly appealing bowling green would remain the same. It would just be a reduced height of the building. In summary, the secondary plan amendment should be supported by the committee to revise the land use designation from service commercial to high density residential. I believe this building is warranted and would be of a net benefit to our ward 
but in its current form does not adequately address the impact on surrounding properties. I implore you to work with the applicant to revise the proposal to address the shadow concerns outlined in the shadow study. Thank you for your time and your consideration. Thank you, Jason. The next speaker is Vabhav Sharma. Uh, please go ahead, Vabhav. You have uh, up to five minutes, and I will give you a reminder at four minutes and 30 seconds. Sure, thank you. Uh, good, evening, good evening, Honorable Chair, Council, Committee Member, and Public. Uh, we live on Hudson Street, and uh, uh, we are a supporter of Brampton 2040 Vision, and we also support the Smart Urban Growth Strategy. Uh, having said that, uh, the building which is being proposed right uh, on this property, uh, we think that uh, according according to the shop, uh, the Rio Can Chopper World Redevelopment, they have proposed uh, a lower density building next to Charlet Boulevard in order to promote and create a sense of shared connectivity with the existing neighborhood. Uh, this having this building of 19 and 26 story would be a very abrupt change to the to the streetscape, and, and if this building is permitted, uh, we are uh, we we request the committee to uh, rethink the the height, and the height should not be more than the current neighboring building, which is which is Amika Peel Village. It has a height of according uh, like around eight stories or 10 stories. It should not be more than that. That's our request uh, to the committee to uh, rethink this application. And that's it for now. Thank you. The next delegate is Tanya Sadu. Tanya, you have up to five minutes. Please proceed. Thank you so much. Uh, good evening to everyone. To, um the city members and the residents as well. Mm -hmm. uh, I think my main concern, as uh, mentioned by my husband, Abdul Sharma, um, is, of course, the, the abrupt change in the heights of the neighboring buildings. But I, I also want to um, note the over 100 trees on the properties uh, that are uh, currently there. There's a wide number of wildlife that resides in that, um, in, yeah. in that environment that I feel like have, will have an impact. I believe that this particular construction will require them to uproot all these old trees that are probably more older than uh, the houses adjacent to uh, uh, to this proposed site. Uh, so I would uh, like the, the city planners and the, the construction company to, to preserve and keep as many trees possible that actually make living here um, uh, with, within the city uh, and in, uh, <clears throat> sorry, uh, help us enjoy our backyards and, and help us uh, enjoy the environment and, and the, the birds and, and the little squirrels that run around uh, around us. Um, so that's, that's my request. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you. The next delegation is Warren Leung. Uh, Warren, you are in the session. You have up to five minutes. You can proceed. So Warren, you can go ahead and unmute your microphone. There we, oh, there we go. Okay. Yep, we can hear you now, Warren. Please proceed. Yeah. I'm on 7 Hudson Street, right behind the proposed uh, building. I've been living there since uh, 1990 for 32 years, and I've been enjoying the, the quiet life like living in the cottage. If, uh, if the building is going to be built now, it's going to be like uh, the main street, Brampton and Charlie, but we're going to be like a concrete jungle. So uh, I hope the builder and the city will consider all this. And just like my neighbors are all saying that we're enjoying our backyard with all the mature trees, that's, I believe most of the trees are over 50 years old. And it's a shame if they have to get rid of all these trees so hopefully they will uh, reconsider this proposal. This is all I have to say for tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Warren. The next delegation is Sandra Lenardi. Sandra, you can proceed. You have up to five minutes. 
Hello, and uh, thank you for giving us this opportunity to speak this evening. Uh, I'd like to thank our uh, counselors for for uh, representing us, and, and I'd like to repeat, pretty much reiterate what people have already stated. Chief among our concerns are shadow cast by the buildings, the uh, high density nature. Uh, by this proposal. It's not in keeping with the established neighborhood. It's not going to create uh, a harmonious um, coexistence uh, with the existing neighborhood. It's not in line with the proposed development at uh, 499 Main Street South, which would be uh, more um, uh, in keeping with you know higher density especially since they're aiming it towards steels as opposed to towards the where the existing residential is um are the concern i live on hodgson street and the parking on the street i don't know what the parking ratio is but uh i uh, chief concern is if people park on our street and uh access you know, take a, a shortcut from our, our street into the the uh, proposed development. And lastly, the environmental impact is already stated. Uh, there's it, it the we've already lost so many trees with the uh, retirement um, development, and they've part of that. Um, agreement was to uh, ensure that they kept as many trees as possible and I would like to reiterate how important that is uh, I think it was Jason that talked about sunlight and how important that is well so is green space and ensuring that we do have green space especially along uh, even the, the, the corridor um, and now lastly my husband's going to be speaking after me and I'd like to uh, second what uh, support what he's going to be uh, talking about. Oh, and I do have two questions. Will we be notified of um, the next steps as far as recommendations and decisions? And how um, uh, how will that happen? And uh, appeals or like what the, the next steps are? Thank you. Thank you, Sandra. The next delegation is Tony Lenardi. Uh, Tony, you can proceed. And uh, Sandra, I guess to your questions through you, Mr. Chair, I guess staff can respond to those questions after the delegations are completed. So Tony, you can proceed. You ha have up to five minutes. Thank you. Thank you for letting me address this committee today. Uh, Brampton, as we all know, is a great place to live and is one of the fastest growing communities in Canada, if not the fastest. This is why I think this committee is probably the most important of the city's committees as this group is at the vanguard of decision-making that affects residents, industry, traffic, and economics. This committee knows that Brampton is more than just a city. It's a group of fantastic neighborhoods, and I live on Hodgson Street, and I'm proud to say that for over 30 years, it has been one of the best neighborhoods in the GTA. There are various concerns with, with this application, which at a minimum, I suggest requires another public meeting. Some of the issues are administrative, but cause confusion. confusion such as the public notice that was sent to residents states that this was for development at 227 and 227, 229 Main Street North, which is more than three kilometers away from the actual location. More pressing is the development at 19 and 26 stories high as a mass and scale which is completely out of scale with the surrounding neighborhood. We need to look at all planning aspects, not just those selected by the proponent. By reading the materials submitted, they have only a couple of sentences in their entire application dedicated to describing, quote, six residential dwellings, unquote, at the rear of the site, and did not describe any appropriate transition, nor do they acknowledge the existing stable community that borders this development site. Now let's talk about intensification corridors. The City of Brampton held many workshops to discuss this particular intensification corridor, the Huron Ontario Main Street Corridor, a few years ago. This concluded in a master plan that included height transition areas, including the subject lands, with a limit to a maximum building height of 10 stories. This appropriate planning, sorry, the appropriate planning that went into developing the Huron Ontario Master Quarter sec, uh, Master Plan has been completely ignored in the application that we see in front of you today. There's no mention of it at all in the materials that I read. 
For reference, City Council did adopt the master plan into a secondary plan, but only up to Charley Boulevard, as the LRT was not approved to go through Main Street north of Charley at that time, which now I understand that the two preferred routes now align perfectly with the path outlined in the master plan. So I would expect that the principles in the in the master plan would apply going north on Main Street as well. The primary concerns with this development deal with the lack of conformity with the applicable policies and compatibility with adjacent land uses in terms of neighborhood character, associated height, density, massing, scale, privacy, sky view, and overlook. When you look at the full streetscape from Main Street, Rio Can to the south has a significant development proposal which has high-rise buildings along Steeles Avenue that scales down in height towards Charlotte Boulevard. Having a 26-story building suddenly appear abruptly would not be compatible with the existing development nor the future plan development along Main Street South. We need to remember that this development will share a backyard with the existing low-rise low residential. There's no road break, nothing. They are going to share a fence between this development and that low-rise low uh, residential communities members. Planners at the city have worked hard on the here Ontario Main Street Corridor Plan, which the recommendation report um, should say uh, is relevant. I would hope that they say that those planning principles are still relevant and applicable to the site and should guide the urban design around in this location. The plan clearly shows that this location, this site, is a transition area and should have a maximum height of no more than 10 stories. Many of the local residents have attended meetings with the city and developers in the past. When the Amica Senior Residence Building was being proposed, city staff and councillors at the time were fully aligned with the local residents and reduced the building height to seven stories, which was modified slightly to allow for some for some step backs. So we trust that the city and the staff and the councils will be supportive of the concerns of the stable residential neighborhood and request that the city and applicant involve the community in future discussions regarding the size, mass, and development of this proposal. This would be consistent with what the applicant says in their materials that consultation is a bedrock principle in their view. We request that if the building height is greater than 10 stories high, that another public meeting be held. That's all I have to say for today. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Tony, the next and final delegation is from Ned uh, Mikloska. Uh, Ned, you have up to five minutes to address the committee. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, committee and the planners for giving us the opportunity to uh, voice our concerns and uh, set a plan for how can we create a win-win situation moving forward, recognizing the need for intensification in Brampton, as well as recognizing the need of blending the development uh, with the existing low-rise uh, single-family dwellings that are very close within the 240 meters of the site. Our, uh, all the neighbors of mine and I am located at 17 Hodgson Street. We have been in the, we have had that house for 21 years now and have enjoyed the peaceful nature of the neighborhood and uh, and once again is what everybody else has said and the sunlight and, and the environment that exists there with the park nearby as well. Um, but keeping in line with the need for development, we recognize that that will go forward and needs to go forward. But as all of my neighbors have stated consistently in this presentation, the dramatic increase in height, the dramatic height of this proposed development of 26 stories and 19 stories is really out of line compared to Amica building or to the Shoppers World redevelopment. Uh, and by going with such a tall, high density buildings, there's clearly going to be an impact on the neighborhood from a shadow perspective, from a traffic flow perspective on Hudson Street, from the uh, privacy impact there, if there is not a consideration also the, for the transition plan between the building and the remaining houses there on Hudson Street and, and adjacent to it, the shadow impact, the environmental impact. Uh, all, of, all of our neighbors have, in this presentation, have said the same thing consistently, and I am now echoing the same concerns uh, as everybody else has so far, and that is of uh, shadow impact on our uh, neighborhood there, the impact of the dramatic height of the two proposed buildings and no transition zone, no step down zone to the neighboring houses. And also um, the fact that it's not aligned with Amica building 
and also aligned with the Shoppers World development. So I look forward to the committee and the planners taking that into consideration and, and taking all of our input into consideration. And as uh, Mr. Lissardi, uh, Tony has said, there definitely should be another follow-up meeting uh, on, on this matter. Thank you. Thank you, Ned. And Mr. Chair, uh, my apologies. We do have one more delegation from Arshdeep Singh. Uh, Arshdeep, you are in the session. You have up to five minutes. You can unmute your mic to address the committee on this matter. Please proceed. Hi, good evening to uh, City Councilor and public. Uh, thank you for giving us the opportunity to speak at this forum. Uh, and I support the city's 2040 vision and I appreciate the city's uh, endeavors in new housing. Uh, that being said, uh, many of uh, my concerns were, were put together by uh, by uh, Jason, uh, Tony, Ned, uh, and Babu. Uh, uh, and adding to that, it, uh, so since we are living at uh, uh, right next to the uh, construction uh, that will be happening, uh, no, it will not only affect the sunlight but uh, also uh, privacy, privacy for our backyards, uh, since it will be right next to uh, our backyards. And uh, uh, one more thing I want to add is uh, uh, the construction near this proximity to our homes um, like has a higher chance of introducing cracks in the foundation. So is there a set plan to address this concern? Uh, yeah, uh, I'll just wrap it up. Uh, that will be all for me. Thank you, Arshdeep. And Mr. Chair, that concludes the delegations for t this item. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Alan Parsons here, uh, Director of Development Services. What, wondering, Mr. Chairman, if you would like for me to respond just to the question about uh, involving and engaging the, the residents about a future recommendation report. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, that'd be great. Thank you, Alan. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And through to the, the residents that have uh, spoken tonight, yeah, thank you, everybody, for, for your comments. Uh, all, all comments will be considered uh, alongside the technical review that will be ongoing with this development application. Uh, really, through the review of, of all the comments received tonight and uh, the contact information for, for the residents that spoke tonight, uh, together with any other further correspondence that's, uh, that is received from other residents as we continue to, to process the application uh, as, as city staff is, is completing those steps, we will be sure to uh, reach out and uh, contact all the, the residents that we have heard from uh, that have noted their, their interest in the application and uh, make them aware of when it is that a recommendation report will be coming at a future point in time uh, through to the planning committee uh, from from staff and uh, that that will occur uh, likely in uh, a, a number of months time so that staff will, will need time to, to review all that detailed technical information and all of these these types of issues I, I can also further advise mr chairman that uh, the public notice for for the item uh, it had noted the the correct address uh, for the subject site uh, there was though a supplementary uh, piece of information that uh, identified the the covid protocols for this meeting that did also have the address uh, for for the site but there it was uh, it was incorrectly noted as as north um, I, I can advise further that the uh, the notice uh, has gone out through mailing through to all of the the landowners within a, a 220 meter uh, setback from the subject property as well as the, the Brampton Guardian uh, as well as on the city's website and through a, a posting on the property as well uh, so really with, within the, the different publications and the, the posting and such you know, staff does feel that uh, that appropriate public notice uh, was was received uh, and and uh, and put out through to the residents we, we will be working with uh, the applicants further and uh, trying to understand and discuss uh, some potential uh, considerations that the applicant can have for uh, uh, additional public meetings, uh, informal public meetings, but uh, but that, that'll be subject to, to dialogue with the applicant. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, uh, Alan, for the explanation. Uh, members of the committee, are there any questions or of clarification? I see none, so I do have a motion uh, moved by uh, Councillor Bowman. Uh, to accept the report and I see we'll see the motion on the screen so I'll take it as read but also to move correspondence and the delegations is there anyone opposed I see none so the motion carries we now move on to our next item item 5.4 application to amend the official plan and zoning bylaw uh, GS uh, GSI uh, Umbria developers incorporated southwest corner of Chincuzi Road 
and Bonnie Bray's Drive Ward 4. And I will now welcome um, our staff, uh, Rob, Nick Fortune. And welcome, Rob, uh, from the Planning, Building, Economic Development Committee. Uh, uh, department, sorry. Okay. Good evening, Mr. Chairman, members of committee, and the public. My name is Rob Nicky Fortune, and I am the city's development planner assigned to process this official plan and zoning bylaw amendment application in support of the proposed condominium townhouse development that was prepared by Glen Schnarr and Associates, who are the planners that are working on behalf of their client, Umbria Developers, Inc. Next slide. The lands subject to this development application are located on the southwest corner of Chinkuzi Road and Bonnie Bray's Drive uh, within Brampton's uh, Ward 4 area. Next slide. Following map is an aerial view of the subject lands and illustrates that the property has direct road frontages on all four sides. Directly abutting the subject property to the south are five residential lots containing single family detached dwellings that front onto Proud Court. The adjacent residential lands to the north and west also contain single detached dwellings. To the east is Chinkuzi Road and beyond is a two-story long-term care facility named Burton Manor and beyond is low density residential uses consisting of single and semi-detached dwellings. Next slide. The subject lands are comprised of two separate parcels that make up a total area of 7.4 hectares or 1.8 acres. These two parcels are created by way of two plans of subdivision that were registered back in 2013. The applicant has filed the subject appli development application to permit the site to be developed for 108 back-to-back -back stacked condominium townhouses that would consist of six buildings and which have a ground floor building coverage of about 35 percent. All required resident and visitor parking will be located below grade, thereby allowing 58 percent of the ground to be used for landscaped open space and outdoor amenity area. A private driveway access connection is proposed from Elmcrest Drive and the on-site paving has been limited to about 6.6 percent of the site area. Next slide. The applicant has prepared a perspective drawing showing how the building could look from the street and has provided a cross-section drawing to illustrate how the back-to-back -back townhouse units will be configured. As you can see, the bottom unit is almost fully below grade, the second unit is slightly above grade, and the third and fourth units are placed back-to-back -back and are two stories in height. Next slide. In accordance with the statutory requ requirements of the Planning Act and the public meeting notice for this development application has been provided in the Guardian newspaper and also by way of direct mail to property owners located within 240 meters of the subject property. Next slide. The application will be evaluated against the existing provincial and municipal policies, including those found in the provincial and the Planning Act the Provincial Policy Statement, the Growth Plan for the Greater Golden Horseshoe, the Region of Peel Official Plan, the City of Brampton Official Plan, and the Credit Valley Secondary Plan. The following slides will provide an overview of the City's governing land use permissions for the subject lands. Next slide. The City's Official Plan sets out the necessary goals, objectives, and policies to guide development in Brampton. Within the City's Official Plan, the subject lands are designated residential on Schedule A, general land use designations, and are located along a primary transit corridor within the transit corridor Schedule C map in the official plan. In addition, the subject lands and the adjacent area are located within the communities and designated greenfield area within the city concept Schedule 1 map in the official plan. The official plan requires that lands that are designated for residential purposes provide development that promotes vibrant, sustainable, and accessible residential communities which accommodate a variety of housing forms, tenure, a mix of uses, attractive streetscapes, walkable pedestrian environment, 
in order to create an overall high quality public realm. Um, uh, next slide, please. Within the sec sorry, within the Credit Valley Secondary Plan, the majority of the property is designated institutional place of worship, and a small portion of the sub southeasterly corner of the site is designated low density residential too. The place of worship policies requires that the lands be reserved for a period of three years from the date of subdivision registration and shall be duly zoned to allow for either a place of worship or low density residential two purposes. After three years, the applicant is then allowed to rezone the lands to permit other suitable alternate residential uses that is consistent with the adjacent residential development. As previously noted, both blocks have since been held in excess of the three years requirement. Next slide. The applicant is proposing to amend the area secondary plan by redesignating the lands for site specific medium density residential two, which allows for the proposed density. Next slide. This is an extract of the approved Credit Valley secondary plan, block plan area 45 5, which also identifies the subject lands as a place of worship. Next slide, please. The applicant is proposing to amend this block plan schedule by deleting the place of worship designation from this plan. Next slide. The, zoning, the subject property has been zoned with two site specific institutional zone categories to implement the existing official plan and area secondary plan policies. The northerly institutional one section 2105 zone currently allows for a three story institutional building that can accommodate a place of worship and school and or a daycare center. The Southerly Institutional One Section 2326 zone currently allows for either a three-story place of worship building or a two-story townhouse development. I didn't note here, but you could also have a group home on either of these lands that could be three stories in height. Uh, next slide. Through the processing of this um, uh, application, um, the uh, following issues have been identified. Actually, I'm sorry, the, the lands are going to be zoned with the site specific uh, uh, insti uh, institutional zone category to allow for the proposed use. So, next slide, please. Uh, through the processing of this application, the following issues have been identified and will require follow up in the future planning recommendation report. First, the proposed condominium townhouse development will need to be assessed with regards to the land use compatibility, noise, and building interface with the adjacent residential development. Second, staff will need to assess the potential density increase and the potential impact on the schools, park, traffic, and servicing infrastructure within this area. Third, staff will need to assess the appropriateness of the proposed building design and the zoning standards that are being proposed. Next slide. The purpose of this public meeting is to provide you, the public, with an opportunity to comment on this proposal and any comments received this evening will then be used in the preparation of a future recommendation report that will be forwarded back to Planning and Development Committee. All members of the public that provide their contact information for this application will be advised when the future recommendation report will be presented. I am still in the process of collecting comments and information for this development application from the internal and external departments and agencies. A recommendation report will only proceed once all technical matters have been reviewed. Next slide, please. Both the public meeting slides shown here tonight and the planning information report for this development application and uh, the slides can and will be found online on the city's website. The final recommendation report will be posted online one week prior to the planning committee meeting. Should you have any questions or require greater clarification on this project, you can either contact myself or the applicant's planning consultant, Mr. Jason Afonso of Lenchner Associates, noted here. And uh, Mr. Chairman, this concludes my presentation. Thank you very much. And uh, I'll hand it over to the city clerk. I do know we have uh, um, some delegations, so uh, city clerk. Through you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee, we have 12 registered delegations for this item this evening. Also, the applicant is present, should there be any questions of the applicant from members of committee. And we have a number of pieces of correspondence under item 11.2. So starting with our delegations, uh, the first delegation is from Jayant Patel. 
Uh, Jayant, you are in the session. You have up to five minutes, and I will give you a reminder at four minutes and 30 seconds. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, this is Jayant Patel, and I, li I live in the neighborhood. I'm not within 20, 240 meters of the area, uh, but this is the road, Elmcrest Drive, that I use uh, every day. And first of all, I want to thank you, Mr. Martin Maderos, Mr. Jeff, Jeff Bowman, our counselors, as well as Rob uh, Nikki Forchin. Uh, for um, assisting with this information and uh, arranging this uh, uh, this meeting as well. Um, the main question I have is, uh, which Rob has also covered in his presentation with issues, um, proposed density, um, people-wise, as well as number of household-wise, and uh, current density in the neighborhood. Uh, that should be more aligned. That is one of the, one of the main challenge we have. Uh, even Rob mentioned in his presentation, traffic, schools, parks, um, business plazas in the area. How will all these be able to cope with uh, 108 households? Um, if anyone has uh, any of the um, city councillors or um, any of the city staff lives in the area and has traveled to Dust Drive Plaza, you would all know that it is so crowded and so not well planned in my opinion um, increasing 108 households in this area will further mess up the whole uh, neighborhood in my opinion even zoning wise i would say that um, when it was proposed as institutional zoning originally as, as per credit valley plan um, I, I would say that whoever envisioned that they 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 understood the community community is not only made up of um, uh, people, but also made up of uh, many services that community needs, as well as the nature environment. And um, as soon as you in, uh, as soon as you increase so many households, it's not fair to them who are moving into this neighborhood, and it's not fair to any of the neighbors living in this area, any of the flora and fauna in the area that um, um, that that will uh, be impacted, and especially negatively. I would suggest that, you know, currently based on the density in the neighborhood, there should be maximum 10 to 20 houses that should be permitted in case zoning is to be changed to residential. Uh, more than that uh, would not make sense. And also, some if, if it was to be institutional, then there should be a facility like fitness center or mental health center or recreation center, something, something like that. That's my proposal. Um, uh, I'm pretty sure that the other residents would like to uh, say more. And I again, thank you for the time. Thank you, Jayant. The next registered delegate was Gurinder Singh Sani. Uh, we don't see Gurinder present, so we'll move on. The next delegation is Bisman Kaur. Bisman, you have up to five minutes. Please proceed. Uh, hi, thank you. Um, my name is Bisman Gore, and I'm a proud resident of Brampton. I'm at this meeting today to voice my support of the Zoning Bylaw Amendment for 8680 Jinkuzi Road. I believe that this proposed medium density residential development is a necessary step for solving the ongoing housing crisis and building a better Brampton. Um, I want to start with the form of the, uh, the residential development. So stock townhomes are a form of missing middle housing, and such developments can provide diverse housing options for families and individuals from various socioeconomic back backgrounds, and they address the changing needs of the population. To solve the ongoing housing crisis, we need to ensure that there are affordable options within the reach of existing and future residents. I am aware that the development might not necessarily be affordable in the strictest sense of the word, as the units will be sold at the presently inflated market rate. However, single-family detached homes, semi-detached homes, and even townhomes are all out of reach for hard-working residents of Brampton. The stock townhome units will still be expensive, but they will be affordable in relation to low-density detached homes. There is a high demand for such housing in Brampton, and the existing supply of townhomes is insufficient for the increasing demand, which is why the average market rate keeps rising on a daily basis. Creating more supply of the missing middle housing that meets the needs of the population will help control the unreasonable increase of home prices in Brampton. Furthermore, the proposed development includes an underground parking garage for cars, therefore further increasing supply by maximizing the number of units that can be built above ground. This is a positive shift from the current system that prioritizes housing for cars with above ground garages and paved driveways over housing for people. 
Changes in these physical structures can lead to changes in attitude on a community-wide level. We can reclaim our streets from cars and return them to the people of the community. The report of the Ontario Housing Affordability Task Force makes it clear that increasing housing density throughout the province will help provide affordable options for Ontarians looking to purchase a home. In particular, increasing housing density in areas with access to public transit will help reduce traffic congestion and emissions. The planned development is positioned at an ideal location to achieve this goal. Chinkusi Road is a major road in Brampton that is served by the 4 bus, which has very frequent service and connects to the Brampton Gateway Terminal. There are also plans in place to implement bus rapid transit on Chinkusi Road, possibly with a dedicated bus lane to improve bus reliability. The development is also within walking distance of Queen Street West, which is served by the number one bus that connects to both Mount Pleasant GO Station and Brampton GO Station. Therefore, many residents of the proposed development will be inclined to use public transit due to its convenience. Existing residents are worried that the proposed development will lead to an increase in traffic congestion, but high-density housing near bus routes with frequent service has the opposite effect. By improving the existing bus infrastructure and building housing with access to this infrastructure, Brampton will begin to see a shift from its reputation as a car-dependent suburb into a transit-oriented community. We need to start thinking outside the constraints of car dependency in order to improve traffic in the area and throughout Brampton, and high-density residential areas like the proposed development are part of the solution. Um, research also suggests that high-density housing will play a significant role in solving not only the housing crisis, housing crisis, but the climate crisis as well. As mentioned earlier, residents of the proposed development will have convenient and reliable access to transit options, which will encourage them to use public transit instead of cars, thus reducing their carbon footprint. To continue, the development is within walking distance of multiple plazas with the following facility, a walk-in clinic, pharmacies, grocery stores, banks, and restaurants. This is very uncommon for a suburban city like Brampton, as most residential areas are situated at a great distance from commercial areas, which means that people inevitably need to drive to access basic necessities like food and medicine. Residents of the proposed development will be able to walk to the plazas for necessary errands due to the convenience of the location, hence further minimizing their carbon footprint. Another major environmental benefit of smaller multi-unit residential buildings is often overlooked. Smaller townhome units require less energy to heat and cool than single family detached homes, but they is still provide- 30 a seconds. Oh, okay, thank you. Um, so these advantages will help transform Brampton into a more sustainable and environmentally conscious city. Um, so I believe it may seem like the majority of residents oppose the development given the views of the people in attendance today, but I believe the vocal minority has managed to propagate misinformation regarding the proposal to gain support. The notice was only sent out to existing homeowners in the area, but the future residents of this neighborhood have been excluded from the conversation without even knowing that the conversation has taken place. I want to provide a voice for those residents before it is too late. They are our future teachers, our retail workers, our bank employees and nurses, and they will be priced out of the Brampton housing market unless we take progressive action now. If the city continues to submit to the demands of the vocal minority in support of exclusionary zoning, Brampton will not flourish. I hope you will consider my defense of the proposed development before making a final decision on the bylaw amendment. Let's welcome more neighbors into our community and build a more inclusive Brampton for all. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Bismarck. The next registered delegate was Mandeep Hayer. Mandeep has withdrawn uh, uh, the, de the delegation. So the next delegation is Kartik Patel. And there is an audio delegation from Kartik, and we are just going to bring it up momentarily. Hello, everybody. I would like to propose my suggestions and my concerns regarding upcoming community development, uh, which I see as a biggest concern for our existing residents. When we buy these properties five, six years before, this place was uh, joined as an institutional use. And then this is the way it turns out to be more dense housing, which brings our, affect our life at peace and our 
community, our children, school, traffic, our safety is all affected. So, I would like to see that uh, city realizes the real need for the residents and the community, which I would suggest. The schools are already crowded. The existing residents cannot even get admissions and these upcoming residents will bring more load. The pub community services like park, recreation center uh, uh, and uh, library, these all are overcrowded already. The day, first thing I would suggest is um, we need uh, community centers or like library or indoor playground something that communicate community can benefit out of it and um, the biggest problem is child care center in this neighborhood either there is no child care center for school going kids so we should think about that and um, during weekend and uh, holidays the state park will be full because of the heavy residents now that will be add more issues for the residents also. This, there is one thing I see in here is from intersection of steels and chinkuzi to steel and chinkuzi to um, Williams Parkway and Misaga Road. There is no community center or library for anything that community can uh, need for their life. The city has to consider about that. I would like to add some other concerns which the there is already two empty areas by Bonnie Brace and James Potter, north side and south side, which is already high residence, like a dense residence permit already. That will add all the issues what we're talking about that. Now, the builder office, which is located on Chinkuzi Road, south of uh, Bonibrish Drive, which is also vacant land, there will be more dense house probably can come, just like what coming now. Also, north of Bonibrish Drive and south of Chinkuzi, there are few old residents which are going to be turned out to be new residents, which will be heavy residents also, or dense residents. Think about those upcoming place can make this place how dense and how much is going to affect including this project. So not only considering this project but all the other upcoming project we have to realize now how we move ahead and we want to make this city safe and pleasure and more exciting to live for residents and understanding realize of community how they can uh, develop and the Brampton will be the best city can be in the Ontario. So we have to realize those uh, problem with what we're trying to bring and achieve and support the need of the real community. Thank you. Members of committee, the next delegation is from Sushil Kumar. Sushil, you are in the session. You have up to five minutes. You can proceed. Hi there. Thanks for the chance to speak here. Um, I live very nearby to the site being discussed. It's about 100 meters. And I work and I take my children to school day in, day out. And I know the real problems of this city, of this area, actually, I would say. Where I see when you go and drop your child to school on a bad day or a rainy day or a snowy day, you'll see so many cars lined up right from as you enter from Chinguzi Road going to Boni Brace, there's a lineup and there's a wait of at least 15 to 20 minutes. People are walking, people are driving, there's a crazy rush, schools are madly populated. We have no space in school at all. And this low density, so-called low density, is not actually a good proposal. I oppose it, as this is going to ruin the people who are going to come and live here. And these houses will not be very cheap. These are out of the reach of the people 
who are thinking that condominiums are within a reachable limit. And think about hospitals. There's already a wait of hours when you go to an emergency. There's no way we can have a low density housing of 108 units times the people living in there, which will be overpopulated. It's a population explosion. And as I said, schools, safety in school zones, the traffic is mad. People are getting bumped into each other. Day before yesterday, I was rear-ended on the same street, Boney Prince. So people do not have time in the morning. Traffic is going crazy. Noise pollution. There are all kinds of pollutions which will come up. Noise pollution, water pollution, land pollution. And then you talk about walkable distance uh, of certain grocery stores. They are already full. There's not many. There are walk-in clinics. There's hours of wait there. People are already suffering. If you make these pigeonholes here, those people will suffer too. If this plan was done about 10 years ago, I don't think this is a good plan now. A place of worship, is, place of worship which was proposed before was an ideal idea, which is non-profit organization. If something which could replace as a non-profit organization, that would be much more beneficial. Where community can get some advantage out of it where communities can thrive instead of making this as a jungle of buildings and people start suffering we've already seen how downtowns urban places are this is becoming another mad rush place i have been living in brampton for so many years but i see the planning and proposals being not up to the mark making a low density Housing does not solve all the problems. The problems will come after this. And I am a local resident here, and I can speak to it, and I can show you physically how things work. If you come in the morning or go in the evening, you will see the rush. You will see the people going on top of each other, bumping into each other, no parking space. There's already pollution. Noise pollution is up to the maximum level already. Go to the hospitals, you will find out how many people are standing already. And due to COVID, mental health, all these issues will come up. So the planning which was done about 8 to 10 years ago is not 100% up to the mark right now. And I oppose and strongly oppose this idea of making 108 units. There should be small detached homes which, which make sense in the vacant land. Moreover, if you can turn this idea over and make something like more useful for the society, then I would be much more happier. People will feel good. Could be a library, could be something which could make some sense to the residents here. And I really oppose this idea and I will do this. And all these residents here are 100% against this idea of making high density or low density 108 ohms. Whether it is uh, parking down below that does not make sense. People will come out. She will be on the road. So people will come out, they'll be on the road, there'll be accidents, there'll be power, still there'll be parking problems, there'll be visitors coming to this residence, which will make a problem. They will have to go to the hospital, which will be a problem. There'll be like going to the grocery stores, there's not enough grocery stores, which makes sense here. And just making a transit idea here that this is more transit as a Brampton transit will go from here is not the only objective of getting low density homes here. And I. I'm sorry to say this is a bad idea, whoever had proposed this idea before. And I strongly uh, take, I will take it up to the maximum level to oppose this. Thank you so much, and I'll pass it on. Thank you, Sushil. The next registered uh, delegate is Manmeet Sibal. Uh, Sibal sorry. Uh, Manmeet has requested to speak at the end on behalf of the Bonnie Braze residents. So we will move on to the next registered delegate, which is Nikhil Vyas. Uh, Nikhil, you have up to five minutes to address the committee. Hello, good evening. Uh, I, I, I second everything that has been said uh, about concerns and issues that are going to come up with this proposed 108 units. I live pretty close by. Uh, 
right off Amcrest Street, which is the proposed outlet for this, this development. And having 108 units, 108 cars going in and out with uh, only one outlet on Amcrest Street, which is a single lane street right off Boney Brace, which the previous speaker mentioned about, about the traffic problem we already have. Uh, it's it's going to be a chaos. It's and and from the previous presentation made by the planning group, uh, the plan, city planner, uh, there was a point in there about doing all kinds of studies from traffic to noise to 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 the development to the school density uh, and other amenities in the area. I would like to know when that study will be available and will the public will have another chance of reviewing it and criti critiquing it and coming up with more amicable solution instead of this 108 units. Uh, of course, the school is a problem. The, the wait list at the local doctor's offices is a problem. The, if you try to go into one of these plazas around this, which one of the speaker was praising a lot, that it's walkable. Yeah, it, it is walkable, but you can't walk. The, the, the parking lots are full. You have to watch out yourself. There have been re, uh, reported accidents in those plazas. At the same time, there have been many accidents on uh, Boney Brace at the intersection of Boney Brace and Amcrest, right where this proposal is being talked about, and of course, at the intersection of Boney Brace and Chinguzi. So traffic is going to be a problem. The, the, the landscape being seems to be a big percentage of 50% of the ground coverage, but would that be enough? You're looking at at least 200 kids in this 108 units. Where are these kids going to play? Where are these kids going to go to park? Where are these kids going to go to school? The school is already full. The only catchment area uh, school that we have in this area is Churchill, and that uh, school already has students sitting in the containers. So. Are we going to ghetto size this residential neighborhood even more than already it is? And mind you, you also have to keep in mind that there are many houses which have uh, basement dwellers. And you don't count those numbers in all this development. So though these are low, devil, uh, low density housing units, but in all intention and purpose, you can might as well call it medium density if you account for the basement people living in the people's basement. So I think if, if the city planning uh, team can come up with all these studies and reports uh, uh, and, uh, and have the public another opportunity to look at it before any conclusion is made on this file. And what I would like to also understand is what would be the criteria or threshold values used for all these studies uh, and, and how it will be reflected when the studies are done as a conclusion and recommendation for this file. Thank you. Thank you, Nikhil. Uh, the next registered delegation is from Gurpinder Hunjun. Uh, Gurpinder, you have up to five minutes. You can proceed. Uh, hello, uh, good evening, uh, everyone. I hope you can uh, hear me loud and clear. As my fellow, you know, neighborhood friends already already mentioned, I also have some more points uh, in there. The 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 if you see the area there, you know, it's all uh, detached houses in the neighborhood. So making 108 stacked down houses. Aesthetically, you, you take a look, you know, I've been living in Brampton for the last 17 years. This is a beautiful city to live in. And, you know, I have a uh, plan to live in this city uh, in the future as well. But if you make like pigeon houses like these, uh, I mean, uh, it, it disturbs the, the, not only the flora and fauna, but also the aesthetics of the, of the city. Uh, and, and, you know, when I purchased my house here, like uh, from the builder, Fieldgate Homes, there was a big board there. It says uh, a place of worship will be uh, built here, right? So, so uh, later on, okay, it was told to us, you know, uh, that uh, place of worship 
uh, or or a low density uh, less uh, less density whatever it is, low density houses will be built here but to see a plan of 108 houses back to back with no backyard what kind of uh, i mean uh, this proposal i i totally you know uh, i agree with the sushil you know my fellow friend he already said you'll go you know oppose it uh, it's not a it's not a good plan um, uh, right now you know if you take a left turn coming north on chingozi Boni Brace, you take left on right now, it's so dangerous. It's a one lane road there. And uh, with 108 houses, like probably 200 more, 200, 300 cars more, uh, we're going to end up in accidents. And plus, people will park on the streets. And they're one, one lane. You, you take a uh, look at Boni Brace, the one lane up to Elm Crest. So it's going to be a mess. It's not going to be a livable city anymore. So I humble request with folded hands. Let this be a uh, livable city, and uh, you know, do something. Please do something. Uh, uh, make uh, if you want to make houses, you know, uh, keeping uh, keeping a view of the neighborhood, how the houses are already built, and go and uh, gel and mix with the with the with the structural uh, you know layout of the houses. Don't disturb it for the sake of I don't know, it's a greed or money. Uh, I, I'm I'm sorry, but I'm going to be honest. So that's one, and then schools. When these kids, you know, the 108 people, uh, 108 houses, people will move in. They will have kids, right? They go to schools, and uh, it's going to be chaos in the schools. Like 23 people or 24, uh, 24 students in the school are allowed. So, are we? Are, is there a plan of more schooling here? Um, plus, you know, um, as I already said, the the parking on the streets, uh, plus the pollution hazard. Um, so many people will come with no backyard, so they're going to be on the streets, you know, especially in the summer, walking around. There's a lot of people on the road, so all chances of uh, cars hitting the people and all that. So not a good idea, again. Um, yeah, th those are the points I have, and, uh, you know, I hope uh, um, the, the study with the proposed plan would have been done, uh, it not to overlo overload our uh, stormwater drain system uh our uh you know uh, any any overload on the sewerage uh, all, all those points uh, probably will need to be taken care of so I, I i again in the end i think given the opportunity and uh you know i hope uh, our, our request will be heard thank you thank you the next de registered delegation is uh harmandeep ray harmandeep you have up to five minutes to address the committee please proceed Thank you. Um, yeah, so I also agree with the last two callers as well in regards to the traffic situation and also the number of units being proposed in this area. Um, so uh, the first item, I, the first item I wanted to touch on is um, so based on this file and the attachments that are um, attached to this file, um, it shows that the last traffic study that was performed in the area was in uh, 2018 and 2019. Um, so what we wanted to know is, will a new traffic study be requested uh, based on the fact that there's been new developments on Allegro? Uh, drive, which also exit onto Bonnie Brace, which will be adding uh, traffic as well once th those units are 100% occupied, um, as uh, the parking spots for this unit are going to be 184, of which 162 will be for the residents. Um, and the second uh, point I want to um, touch upon is just in terms of the zoning. So I actually live on Proud Court, so my house will be backing onto the site in question. Um, so. Um, uh, uh, the first time I want to touch upon is uh, in terms of the change to the zoning because um, this was initially zoned for a low density two and I believe it's being proposed to switch to medium density two. Um, so for those that live on Proud Court, when we purchased our homes, um, it was confirmed to us by uh, the builder, which is Fieldgate at the time, also by the city and also by the mayor at the time, which we received in our new home letter that this area will be developed for um, a place of worship or low density housing. Uh, now, based on this proposal to switch it to medium density, um, we now feel that we've been cheated or somewhat deceived since this information is now being changed um, based on, I guess, the fine print you can say that the city has the ability to change the zone at, at uh, any time. Um, um, and then the, the few questions that we actually had for the uh, builder as well is just in terms of those homes that are actually backing onto um, the the site for those that are on Proud Court. 
um, if this proposal does go through and 108 units are built, uh, what, will, what will, will be the height of these units compared to the current homes on uh, Proud Court as uh, some of our backyard pri privacy will be impacted depending on the height of the new units? Um, and the second one question that we have is, what will be the impact to our foundation of, to the homes that are being uh, backed onto this uh, area with the underground parking garage? Thank you. Thank you, Harmandeep. The next registered delegation is from Daryl Wolf. Daryl, you have up to five minutes to address the committee. Please proceed. Uh, good evening. Thank you. Uh, Harmandeep actually just stole my thunder because he touched on the points that I wanted to make. So, uh, but just to, just to uh, build on what Harman said is, it's all fine and dandy when you're buying the house. You get these acknowledgements and you get these, uh, these notifications in your package and you get a very, very nice, decent letter from the, from the mayor and the city of Brampton indicating on what the proposed vacant lands can be and cannot be. Nothing is mentioned about rezoning after three years. And to my fellow resident who supports this build, she has no idea what 108 townhouses in 1.85 acres is going to get residents. It's basically like my other fellow resident said, it's pigeon coops. I want to know where the quality of living is and where it is going. You're talking about 108 uh, townhouses in 1.85 acres. That's 750 square foot per townhouse. Not taking into consideration the, the city street, the, the landscaping and all that. I mean, where are we going to stop? How populated do you want a city to get? How much traffic do you want these areas to be engulfed in? I mean, you go downtown, do you want to drive downtown? No, you can't drive downtown, but we don't have the infrastructure of, of the transit system like the downtown has, the subways. We don't have that here. And I'll tell you something, my fellow resident, my neighbor, a couple of years back got run over and nearly died on Bonnie Bray and Chinkuzi. And now you're putting 108 townhouses here with an average of three to four people in a townhouse. You're talking about 400 people with 184 car, a parking garage underground. It's going to be madness. We've got the trustees from schools coming and saying there is no place in the schools. I mean, who's planning these things? Who's taking into account what existing people who spent their hard earned money to buy houses here are now going to have a low quality of life just because a builder bought the land and the city says we want to have affordable housing. And to my fellow resident who thinks it's going to generate carbon footprint, if you can afford a house, which is $750,000, you're going to afford a car. So don't tell me you're going to be walking. The people using the transit system, the buses over here are people, are students and, and the people who are renting basement apartments. So it's not happening. The other thing I want clarification is on my purchase of the house, I'm the corner unit here, 10 Proud Court, and my side faces Chinkuzi Road. I was charged a premium for the corner lot. Who's going to be responsible for that premium? The builders know where to go, is not going to do anything because they're going to say the city had access, uh, access to the land. Like, what's going to happen to my privacy? What is happen happening to my quality of life when I purchase this place? For the last, from the time I bought this house in 2016, for three years, this land was used as a dumping site for the dirt. I couldn't use my backyard. Now you're going to put 108 townhouses, which is right looking into my bedroom window. Forget about using my, my, my backyard. I'm not working here to please the city. The city is supposed to be looking after the residents, not making it a congested area, not lowering the quality of life. 750 square foot per house? Come on. You guys must be joking. Even I can tell you that's not feasible. You can do any, any amount of studies, that's not gonna do it. So that's one thing, traffic congestion. I mean, the congestion is just gonna go out of, out of, out of whack as my other fellow uh, residents has mentioned, right? So we gotta look at all that. We gotta look at safety of, the, of, of our kids. You want those kids to be playing on the main street on Elm, uh, Elm Crest and, and Bonnie Bray? It's not happening. So there is not enough of land, I can tell you, to build 108 townhouses and support 500 people coming into those townhouses. It's not happening. 
whatever your feasibility studies the builder is going to provide you with, it's both BS. Pardon my French. Uh, so my question is, how is the city going to manage the congestion? How is the city going to manage the overpopulated schools? How is the city going to manage the overcrowded hospitals, Darryl, the clinics, the dentists? I'm going to believe it at that. Thank you for the time. Thank you, Daryl. The next registered delegate is Manvinder Pabla. Manvinder, you have up to five minutes to address the committee. Please proceed. Okay, good evening, Honorable Chair, Council Members, Planning Committee, uh, fellow residents. Uh, my name is Manvinder Pabla. I'm a 34-year resident, proud resident of the city of Brampton. I grew up here, went to school here, high school here. And so I know Brampton, the city, the footprint area. And uh, as a resident, and a former parent school chair council member of Churchville Public School, I like to bring the following concerns from the fellow uh, representing over 250 residents of the Bonnie Bray neighborhood, um, residents that have brought these concerns to, to our attention and we're bringing it to your attention. Uh, again, the major concerns, a lot of the sentiments some fellow residents have spoken about is the major concern is that Currently, there is a cap at Churchville Public School, one of the only public schools in the area from K to eight school. Uh, residents with, residing within cannot even attend due to the uh, cap limit and are upset because when they moved into this area, because of the lure of the school, there and the, the school admin is saying, sorry, we're up to the cap. And just as a some, some statistics, 2015, the, the number of Students was 887. In 2016, it was 917. 2017, it was 898. 2018, it was 1012. 2019, it's 1029. Sorry, I don't have anything for 2020 or 21. Or actually, the current year, this current year, we're up to 921, and that's capped. And next year, it's also been capped, and next year, they're anticipating 1010. Uh, currently, we have an overflow of 140 students into other schools, and that, that's not being accommodating. Uh, and speaking with uh, our, our school trustee, Kathy McDonald, um, the common question other residents have, have addressed is, where are you planning to accommodate kids? Like kids not only in this plan subdivision, but uh, also the Allegro development has also added to the stress of the enrollment into this area and it's still not 100 percent occupied so that that's a that's a huge concern are you willing to inform families that their children are not able to attend the, the, the closest school and would be transferred elsewhere you know someone coming in for the lure and purchasing a house and then finding out that oh by the way your your, your kid has to be your child has to be bussed elsewhere how realistic is that to them right and there was a traffic study done by the school back in 2020, and there's a lot of traffic concerns that, that have been addressed, and some of the residents have also brought it up. Um, in the morning and the afternoon, the traffic gets backed up on Bonnie Brays. You have the crossing guard there as well that's stopping the flow of traffic for allowing the kids to, to walk to school, but that causes a backup. A lot of people trying to merge her in and, and get in and make left turn lanes and... and, and uh, it, it, it's a zoo. Yeah, you guys should come out and, and witness it for yourself. A lot of people trying to get into the Kiss and Ride that's only open in the morning. In the afternoons, the Kiss and Ride is closed because of this traffic study. And that throws an overflow onto the supporting arteries, side streets, and everything else. So people have nowhere else to go but park all around. Double park, triple park, illegally parked, you name it, it's happening. And U-turns are just always a common concern because people are just making U-turns at a whim and, and having no dis disregard in front of the school on Bonnie Bray. So um, lastly, the enrollment cap was approved back in February of 2017 and then further amended back in March of 2018. And as someone alluded, the, the school already is at the maximum of 12 portables. So there's no other means of bringing in other portables or other expansion to the school to accommodate the students. So um, 
all in all, if you take into consideration and, and really realistically look at the Allegro development, that is not 100% occupied. So where are you going to put those kids? Also in this plan development, in this uh, area, where are you planning to put those potential kids uh, for, for, for schooling? So uh, that's all I'd like to say on behalf of myself and the Bonnie Bray community. We thank you for listening and appreciate your time. Thank you very much. Thank you, Manvinder. The next registered delegate is Parminder Graywall. Parminder, you can unmute your microphone and you have up to five minutes to address the committee. Please proceed. All right, thank you so much. Uh, good evening. Thank you for the opportunity, Mr. Chair, members of committee and uh, city clerk to let me share my views on this potential zone changes. Uh, my name is Parminder Graywall. I'm a resident of Ward 4. I have been a resident of Brampton for, for 20 plus years. Um, let me start by saying that I strongly oppose the zoning change of this land at this intersection of Chincusi and Bonnie Brace, and I live in this subdivision. And when we purchased our properties from the builder, uh, we were informed that this will be a place of worship built on this land. If this, uh, if the zoning is to to be changed, it will it would be a low density residence basically, and uh, we are now being informed that this will be a high density residential development this will be an issue for the residents of the subdivision and the neighboring subdivisions as this will impact us all there's a re the, the residents negatively it will impact us all the residents negatively in many ways some of the immediate negative effects uh, are our schools are already overcrowded as it is now. And uh, as Minvinder mentioned, there is another subdivision that's uh, or more homes being built by Allegro that are where people haven't even started moving in and our schools are already overcrowded. Um, and building more homes and, and, uh, and, and this would be an issue. Currently, kids who are moving into the area are bused into the other areas or to the other schools and they don't get a spot in the in the neighboring schools, the schools that are supposed to be, they're supposed to be going to for sometimes a year, sometimes it takes two years for them to go to their home schools. So this is one of the big one of the big concerns that we all, all of us have as a as a neighborhood. I know one of the the, the delegates uh, as uh, ex is is actually for this change, but I would say all the delegates that we heard after that one person, everyone is opposing, and I strongly oppose this, as, as this new high density development will cause strain on the sewage system, will create potential risks with flooding and uh, down the road in the future again, because if you look at the initial planning that was done a number of years ago, all of these high density homes, whether it's the the, the corner, southwest corner of Chincuzi and Bonnie Brace or the Allegro, uh, 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 development that's in progress at this point were not part of that plan, and the and the system that was built to support this entire subdivision was not uh, accounting all the, these additional homes and this additional load that we are putting on our sewage system and the and the other uh, uh, other services that we 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 have in this area. And again, from the safety perspective, uh, it is uh, suggested in the letter that we received that the, the, with this zone changes, the entrance of the new development will be from the, El, uh, the entrance will be from the Elm, Elm Crescent, uh, which makes the Elm Crescent and Bonnie Bray's intersection even more unsafe. Uh, Elm, Crent, uh, Elm Crest is all already very narrow, which means one of the, which means uh, on, the, on the Elm Crescent itself, you can only park on one side of the street. Uh, so again, adding 108 cars or sorry, 182 cars and plus um, additional traffic, uh, I think it would would make the, the, the entire intersection very unsafe. Uh, the kids who live on uh, on Elm Crescent, Proud Court, uh, uh, Bandera Drive, Very Street, all those kids uh, and and the on the other side as well, not just on on the on, on the south side, but also on the north side. If you look at where are those kids going to go play? There are there's barely a park, uh, a small park in the area on Elm Crescent. Uh, there are no other amenities for kids. There are no other amenities for seniors. Uh, so what, when we are thinking about zoning changes, what we should be thinking about uh, developing this land is the city should think about our youth 
Uh, City of Brampton should build a facility where youth can gather and be mentored for education, career goals, activities to develop their skills for the real world, rather than building more homes and more homes. Now, the city should think about stopping the brain drain of our skilled youth. We should build a dedicated facility where accelerators and incubator programs can be can help potential entrepreneurs in our community. You have 30 seconds. Them. Okay. Uh, with like-minded uh, mentors from the same industries, which will eventually help them with creating bigger and high-paying local jobs. Uh, we don't have much left land, land left in Brampton to develop, so we should think about protecting the available lands to build amenities that 8-year-old and 80-year-old can use so that the city can be more age-friendly. Uh, as the city of Brampton will be getting the third hospital uh, and an expansion to the Peel Memorial Hospital, we should be thinking about bringing a medical research companies to Brampton and or their headquarters. This would help move, uh, the community step, uh, the city move forward and, and stop the brain drain. Furthermore, there are no libraries in this neighborhood. The neighborhood is, is full of youth and full of school. Uh, schools are full, uh, overflowing with kids. Developing a library for these students where mentorship programs, activities can be hosted would only benefit the community. This will be in a line with the local university campus coming in downtown Brampton. And I'm just going to take another 30 seconds. In this, uh, in the city's vision of 2014, City of Brampton talked about environment, jobs, social matters, etc. The zoning changes like these do not align with Vision 2014. Changes like these drive us further from the Vision 2014. A better quality of life, making the city of Brampton a bigger bedroom city where people are going to neighboring cities to work, accessing amenities and coming back to Brampton to sleep. I would mention there, are, there may only be 15 delegate, de delegates in this meeting, but if this was an in-person meeting, then there would be hundreds of residents coming out and attending the meeting and op opposing this proposal. So in the closing, I would like to say that uh, with that, all the talent that we have in the city of Brampton, we can make it better and, imp and improve the quality of life of our residents. And thank you to the members of committee. I appreciate your time. I am, I'm hopeful that the planning and the development committee will listen to the residents and will use this land for the advantage of its resi uh, neighboring residents. Thank you. Thank you, Parminder. The final speaker is Manmeet Sibal. Manmeet, you have up to five minutes to address the committee. Thank you. Good evening, Mr. Chair, planning committee members, and public members. My name is Manmeet Sibal, and I'm re representing 250 plus public members, or members of the community, and 300 plus online petitioners. I'll try to avoid repeating the issues which are already well discussed by my fellow residents, and I echo that, I second that. I'm going to start with the feelings and the observations of the neighborhood, and I'll conclude with the suggestions from the neighborhood. The first feeling or the observation of the neighborhood is, a dream was sold not a very long ago. So this is not a 50-year-old community where we are still having the you know, original owner occupying the properties. It is a feeling of being cheated as their investments are under risk on the name of affordable housing. When I say investment, it's not just the monetary gain. It is time, it is dream, it's future plans, it's a plan for the kids, right? So we are feeling, we are feeling being cheated. Second is, I also want to point out that we did not receive enough information from the public reps. We were expecting more from them. We felt like we are talking to builders, advocates. At one time, we were told that if we oppose this plan, the builder will go ahead, go to the Ontario Land Tribunal, and ask for compensation in the form of additional housing. Are we kidding? Are we going into that mode? Are we going to discourage the, the neighborhood with these kind of sentences? So this was not expected out of the public reps. And the third is, uh, it's, it's a very strong feeling, and residents are trying to understand who the city is working for. So is the city only working for collecting more money or are we trying to make the life better for the citizens of this, of this city? Now, these are about the feelings. Now, next thing is we are not, we just want to emphasize on this point that we are not against any development. We all, we all are Brampton citizens and we are proud Brampton citizens and we want Brampton to be number one city of Canada or probably the number one city of, of the whole world. But development at what cost? How much can we squeeze in the name of affordable housing? What is the definition of affordable housing? Do we have any evidence that high medium density is actually benefiting the population? It should. On the contrary, it is benefiting city in terms of tax collection and builders to increase their wealth. 
this area needs rec center this area needs school this area needs amenities more than anything else so coming to the proposals coming to suggestions we propose to stick with the original plan which was low density housing secondly we want partnership in decision making we propose to include community representatives in the planning decisions the decision should not be done behind 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 the closed doors your one stroke your one signature can ruin the life of the neighborhood we are not given enough time to read the information because we received the full package on 4th of march we are still assessing the technical aspects of that but including representatives from the city from the from the from the neighborhood will help city and residents to discuss all the objections and suggestions in detail and we all will together make an informed decision so rather than regretting at the decision at the latest stage let's make an informed decision let's include the citizens of brampton with that i'm just going to conclude my argument and we strongly oppose the amendment plan thank you thank you and that concludes the delegations mr chair and there is correspondence under 11.2 on the site thank you very much uh, members of committee are there any questions of clarification i see none so i will uh just ask from uh, some questions of clarification. Uh, uh, so if the committee uh, allows the chair be heard. Um, and this question is uh, to planning staff. Uh, so there seems to be uh, a lot of comments and I guess some misconceptions, because uh, I know Councillor Bowen and myself had the opportunity to meet uh, with some residents and uh, I thank all the residents who invited us there. And I think some of the statements just at the last delegation about um, what was stated. Uh, Alan, can you explain, uh, or Alan or planning staff, can you just walk through so residents understand um, the role of the Ontario Municipal Board, uh, understand how the planning process works, because this is a public meeting, and at this meeting, uh, 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 councillors can express uh, basically their, their uh, support or their opposition uh, to this. This is really about collecting uh, uh, questions and, and getting uh, areas of uh, clarification. But just very quickly, and I know we do this at the beginning of each meeting, um, you know, in terms of the planning process, how going forward, uh, the second question I would have is uh, commenting bodies, because I know we hear the school board a lot, and I appreciate uh, that the school trustee was uh, uh, reached out to. Um, and uh, just understanding as part of the planning application, will the school board uh, provide comment? And then my last question, and I know that's always been an issue, if uh, they can, if, if planning staff can speak to, when we get applications uh, of this sort, and one of the, the frustrations I think all council feels and councillors feel is that obviously when we approve uh, new resident neighborhoods, and, and this would be no different, um, and when we look at population trends, um, how much do we take into account, for example, people who are unaccounted for. And I know this has been a topic, uh, uh, the councillor Bowman and myself and uh, some of the other councillors have been very sort of passionate against because we get in the situation where you get a new subdivision, you get a new school, and then ready the school's over its capacity. But based on all our population trends and the information we have, um, with the amount of housing we approve, the school should have been sufficient. But then there's a certain percentage of unaccounted people, uh, be it through illegal dwellings or something, and, and that sort of forces the numbers uh, to be skewed. So I know I put a lot on your plate, but just if you can clarify those things. So one is just, again, outlining the role of um, the Ontario Municipal Board. And uh, so people understand that uh, there is uh, um, that option, regardless of what the decision after. And then after the second one, uh, again, would be uh, in terms of uh, commenting bodies, including the school board. And third, uh, our sort of population projections when we approve uh, planning. I know there's a lot on your plate, but just if you can provide any comments. Thank you, Alan. Sure. Th thank you, Mr. Chairman. So, yeah, w with respect to those three three matters, so I, I can first uh, start off by really referencing the, the, the process. And uh, really similar to what R Rob had uh, had put forward, you know, through his presentation previously and just to, to build off of it, you know, staff will be receiving all of the, the technical uh, comments from our various uh, external agencies as well as internal departments. Uh, in relation to the application that we've uh, circulated them with. We'll, we'll be hearing from the, the environmental uh, 
uh, uh, conservation authorities. Uh, we'll be hearing from uh, the, the region, from the, the school boards as well. So the, the school boards will be providing us, us with comments, uh, identifying really how many individuals, uh, children, that is likely to, to be uh, really um, uh, created by way of the, the residential uh, development here and how many students would be resulting from, from that to, to attend at their schools and how they have an ability to accommodate those children or potentially not and how they, they may have to be bused. But that, that's information that we'll be receiving from the, the both the, the public district school board as well as uh, the Peel District Catholic School Board. And we'll, we'll be uh, really uh, really reviewing that information and having it uh, you know, help us with a uh, recommendation that we'll be putting forward to the committee at, at a later point in time. We'll, we'll be including all that information within a, a recommendation report as well. And all, also responding to all the, the residents' questions and concerns as noted uh, with respect to all of the different uh, subject matter and providing our, our responses to, to those matters, some additional information and um, you know, putting that information through to committee so that uh, a decision can be made. Um, with respect to the the, the appeal uh, process that uh, could be available you know, through to either the, the proponent here, the, the applicant, or through to any, any residents that may choose to appeal a, a decision of, of council ultimately, you know, if, if it is that the matter is going to the Ontario Land Tribunal you know, through an appeal, there, there is an opportunity for the the applicants to, to make some changes to their application that we've seen in the in the in the past you know, that that has been an occurrence and so uh, really I, I think it, it is important for for anyone to really understand you know, what might transpire uh, at a later point in time if it was that uh, perhaps the the application was uh, to be refused that there there is an ability for the applicants to appeal that matter and to contemplate some some changes to, to the application early at, at that time as well for the Ontario Land Tribunal to, to consider um, with, with respect to uh, your question uh, mr. chair uh, about uh, that the planning that the school boards do uh, really for their facilities and how it is that they you know, contemplate all the uh, statistics and uh, number of individuals and students that are, that are anticipated from, from the area. Uh, they, they do do that uh, really at an early stage. They do plan for the for the residential community that uh, that is planned for by way of our, our official plan and, and our secondary plan. Uh, there is sometimes uh, the, the need for those school boards to to uh, modify their their plans, knowing that that the area has developed in in some uh, different ways some some with some deviations from the original plan uh, we, we know that too that has had to be the case uh, to to some extent with uh secondary dwellings basement apartments and such you know there there always is this uh instance of uh larger lots that are not developed at the first instance but uh, developed at a, at a later point in time and and there are are changes that occur, you know, sometimes on lots such as this, as the proponent is proposing here, and the, the school boards try to accommodate really all of those you know, uh, pieces of information criteria and come up with uh, the best uh, arrangement for for their schools and facilities at, at that earlier point in time. But but yes, there, there is a need for for them to sometimes make these changes, uh, accommodate those changes, additional uh, students by way of portables. Uh, potentially through busing as well, but uh, what what we see uh, really in you know, the city of Brampton, various GTA municipalities, that uh, some of this uh, demographic and the number of students within a, a certain geography, they there are the really ebbs and flows and high points and and low points over time. So while it is at this point in time that. The, the the school boards are having to utilize portables uh, there is some need in certain areas of the city for them to utilize busing it, it may very well be that at a later point in time just the, the way the demographics shift that there there will be a, a, a reduced number of students uh, and so that that's found in various areas in, in toronto similarly but uh but yeah mr Chair, by all means if, if there's a, another piece of information that you'd like for me to, to speak to then by all means yeah, and, and thank you very much, uh, uh, Alan, for uh, the answer. So uh, I think the um, you know in terms of the application process per se, and I, I know we've uh, outlined it, uh, but sort of the commenting bodies, uh, um, you know, uh, uh, we've heard concerns around traffic, we've heard concerns about um, amenities and so on. So that all gets addressed in the application that comes back to uh, for our consideration. 
That's right, Mr. Chairman. So yeah, we, we will be looking at all of those technical aspects. And Rob, Rob Nicky Fortune, through his presentation, identified some of the, the, the key issues that we'll be looking at. But we'll, we'll, any that might not have been identified there really in, a, in a full range of issues that we all look at, uh, sort of that staff always looks at for, with our development applications, we'll, we'll be doing that here as well. And so within that future recommendation report, we'll have uh, really a full range of information as it relates to, to each of the, the criteria that we use to identify the appropriateness uh, of an application. We'll be identifying all those details within that future report and responding to all the residents' issues as well. And just uh, just a last question, Alan. I know this is a a very uh, it's a simple question, but I, I think sometimes residents get confused when um, you know they express uh, concern. Why does the city of Brampton allow these applications? Uh, does council have the ability, or does the city of Brampton have the ability to stop these applications coming forward? And I know this is a more of a complex, and it's in legislation. Uh, but just you know, very simple. You know, when we try to explain uh, places to grow legislation, and we have to meet certain numbers. But does the city of Brampton have power uh, to stop you know development, or say, uh, for example, uh, we don't want to accept an application? Yeah, so very, very good point, Mr. Chairman. You know, for the for the community members to, to understand, you know, with uh, with development applications uh, being submitted through to the city, there is no ability that the, the city has in to refuse uh, an application being submitted for our review and, and uh, recommendation and decision by council. So any development application of whatever sort it is that a landowner would like to make for for the for the property. Uh, to develop it in, in whichever form they, they you know, want us to, to review it through. Uh, we, we do have to, we're obliged to receive those applications, to process them, to bring them through to public meetings, uh, to go through the, the, the full process, hear from community members about their thoughts on those applications, which is which are all really critical you know, points to the, to the planning process that we have here in Ontario. Uh, but uh, ultimately, uh, yes, it will be that uh, that city staff through a recommendation report at, at, a, at a, a later point in time after the processing of, of any application, we, we make our recommendations through to, to planning committee uh, for planning committee's consideration uh, and ultimately uh, a decision made by, by planning committee and then ultimately you know, through to council. And that, as stated previously, there there's a, an appeal period uh, and an, an uh, appeal opportunity you know, by way of either the, the proponent if the application is refused or by way of uh, any uh, third party individuals if it is that the application is approved. Okay, thank you, Alan. And again, just as a reminder to folks, anyone who has further questions of clarification or uh, comments, they can uh, write to uh, Rob directly. And if you just want to give your email again, Rob. <laughs> My email address is my first name dot last name, so it's Rob dot Nikki Fortune N Y K Y F O R C H Y N at Brampton dot C A. And that is on the back end of the slides here that are available also from the clerk's office online. Great, thank you very much. Uh, so I don't see any further uh, questions of clarification. So I do have a, a motion moved by Councillor Bowman to approve the staff report. Recommendations and applicant uh, delegations and uh, correspondence. Uh, is there anyone opposed? I see none, so the motion uh, carries. Uh, and now we move on to uh, public delegation. Uh, and um, I will hand it over to, I believe, uh, we have one delegation, uh, City Clerk. Through you, Mr. Chair, we have item 6.3, delegations from Enzo Bertucci regarding the minutes from the Brampton Heritage Board of February 15th. And we also have a related delegation from Paul Willoughby, uh, board member Brampton uh, Heritage Board regarding this item. Okay. So Enzo, you are in the session. Uh, you can unmute your mic and we will bring up your presentation momentarily. Thank you very much. Uh, I would start with the February 14th letter first, actually, if that's okay. Yeah, perfect. Thank you. Good evening, Chair Maderos, community members, city staff, and members of the public. My name is Enzo Bertucci, and I'm the Director of Land Development at Brian Haven. Thank you for allowing me this opportunity to speak with you this evening. I'm returning this evening as a follow-up from my previous delegation at the January 17th, 2022 Planning and Development Committee meeting. 
I also recently gave a delegation at the Brampton Heritage Board meeting on February 15th, 2022. Here to speak on our property, which is located at 8940 Credit View Road. Specifically, I would like to speak to you about the residential dwelling that is situated on the property and is referenced as the Edwin Trimble House. As I explained to the Heritage Committee on February 15th, and as you can see by this letter that's in front of you that was prepared by the previous landowner, Richard Starrett, the house that currently is on the property is not the original home built by his family. This was a secondary residence that was built later on and does not merit the consideration that has been placed on it of heritage significance. As part of our development proposal for these lands, we were required to prepare a heritage impact assessment by a qualified consultant. The report was submitted in June 2021, and within the body of that report is a checklist titled Table 1, Criteria for De Determining Property of Cultural Heritage Value or Interest. Uh, so to the, uh, if you could put it back to the first document that shows that table uh, with the colors on it, I'd appreciate it. So this here is the table one that I'm referencing. Um, this table lists nine criteria that one is to use in order to determine a heritage value. And if you look at this document, you can see that there's three criteria that support the cultural heritage value and six that do not support it. Yet the formula is so heavily skewed to try and protect these structures that even a three out of nine grade will give it a passing grade on this. I'm concerned that the main reason that the Heritage Board continues to want to see this home protected as it's one of the last ones in the area. And it, this was admitted as much to me at our February 15th meeting. This home should be judged on the merits of the heritage value and not based on the fact that there aren't any other ones remaining. Like many other planning types of applications that would come before this committee, each file should be judged on its own merits and not whether or not it's one as opposed to 10 applications. We are here re again requesting as we did back in January that this committee overturn the recommendations of the Heritage Board and allow us to remove this dwelling as par part of our current development process. Our land is the last piece of undeveloped land in this area and this would allow for the completion of this community with homes that are similar in form to what is currently built there now. As part of the removal, we would be happy to undertake a demolition of the home that is both sensitive and respectful to the history of the Springbrook community and use material salvage to build an acknowledgement piece that can inform the public of the importance of this community. Thank you, and I'd be happy to answer any questions from the committee. Thank you. Uh, the next delegation is Paul Willoughby, uh, board member, Brampton Heritage Board. Uh, Paul, you have up to five minutes to address the committee. Please proceed. Mr. Chairman, uh, fellow councillors, um, staff, and uh, public. Uh, the, at the last uh, Brampton Heritage Board meeting, the members present were all in against the demolition of the house that is presently standing on this property. And the reason why is that it is a vernacular Queen Anne. It is not a pure Queen Anne, but it is vernacular Queen Anne, which means it is partially Queen Anne, which is very rare in the city of Brampton. And also, uh, Mr. The developer is saying that this is not the original house on the property. I know. There were, for, there were previous houses on the property, but if he is paying it, like, okay, that property was settled many, 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 many years ago. So the first house on that property was probably a log house or a log cabin, which is long gone. So the argument is, mute. We are trying to save a house that was built between 1895 and 1900. And it is a beautiful house. It is in good shape. It can be easily restored. We would like it moved closer to Credit View Road. We would like the trees that are on the north side of it uh, also saved. And we would, and there is no reason why this house cannot be saved and, uh, and, and 
I, I just, um, I'm sorry. Um, I get worked up about these things. Um, it's, um, it's, uh, it's a no, it's a, there's no, uh, there's no reason why that this house should not be saved. The, um, the, there's room for houses that uh, the developer is wanting to build in other areas on that property, which um, will return him, I'm sure, a good profit, which he can, which where whereby he can afford to fix up the. the A long time, early settlers of Ingakusi Township. There were several of them that were uh, school trustees, not Edwin, who built this house, but some of his cousins were school trustees in Chingakusi, and um, they they were very very well known and were large landowners in Chingakusi Township. Thank you. Thank you very much. Are there any uh, questions uh, for the delegations? Uh, I see none. Uh, Councillor Bowman, go ahead. Chair, um, I had put this off. I was the, uh, the, the one who put off and sent it back to the Heritage Board. Um, once Enzo had brought this forward, once Brent Haven had brought this forward about not being the original home. Um, we had a meeting with our own heritage staff, uh, Councillor Medeiros and I, last week. Councillor Vicente was also there. Um, and we heard back from heritage staff in their minutes. Um, you know, I fully respect the heritage committee. It's, it's a group of individuals um, who know a lot about the city they are they are sort of experts in typical design um so i put a lot of faith in what they have to say and uh you know i i know it's important to the developer to be able to move this uh to be able to move the house or remove the house um but you know what our, our own heritage staff says that this is an important house to be included in the development our heritage committee says this is an important house to be included in the community councillor vicente um, confirmed that he agrees it's an important house to be uh, um, in this community as well so um you know I, I i can't argue with that these people are all experts so i'm going to uh, move receipt of the minutes and uh and receipt of the delegations as well unless other people want to speak thanks okay thank you councillor bowman so i do not see any uh further speakers so we do have a, a motion of receipt um of uh the delegations and of the minutes through you mr uh, chair yes just to clarify so it is receipt of the delegation and approval of the minutes of the brampton heritage board just want to clarify that's the intent yeah that's that's the intent thank you city clerk is there anyone opposed I see none, so the motion carries. Um, so we are now staff, oh, we're done with the presentations, and uh, we've done with committee minutes, so we are now to, uh, refer, so we have a deferred matter, so oh, we dealt with that one, right? That, yes. that item's been dealt with at council, yes, Mr. Chair. Yes, so correspondence we dealt with. Councilor question period, are there any questions from members of the committee? I see none. So our next is public question period. Uh, City Clerk, do we have any member questions from members of the public? There are none, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much. Our next is uh, our next item is adjournment. So I do have a, a motion moved by Councillor Vicente uh, uh, to adjourn. So our committee meeting is now. Our next meeting is March twenty first. Is there anyone opposed? I see none. So the motion uh, carries. And uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, Thank you, everyone. Thank you, staff, and uh, thank you for everyone who delegated today. Uh, have a safe and uh, uh, good night. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of committee. We're just going to wait.